I think this is one of the better, you know, poker individual tournament situations that I've heard. Uh, yeah. They're just sort of um, really powerful. You weren't going to play and then you hop in this tournament. So you were, did you really lose 5,000 Australian? Yeah. So uh, kind of like tie all of that together. You know, I was backed uh, up until 2013. You know, after Black Friday, I was in bad financial shape, like a lot of poker players were. Uh, and I was in makeup. And so I won that WPT. And when I went on that WPT, I was over like 300K in makeup. So I got that. And then that got me a seed into the TOC, the Tournament of Champions that year. Um, or I guess it was pre Tournament of Champions. It was our, our seed and ending event back when it was a 15K, but not the TOC. And I got third in that for like 450. So that cleared it. And then I was on my own from then. And then, you know, like most gamblers, things were kind of up and down in the, in the couple of years that followed. But leading up to that trip in Australia, poker for me had been really down. Like I had one cash in the previous year leading up to that. If you glance at the Hendon mob, I'm pretty sure that cash was early 2016. And I think all of 2015, I had one or two caches and I was in a terrible mental place with poker. Just really just didn't like the game. I had been focusing on uh, daily fantasy sports and a little bit of sports betting and that had gone actually really well. So all my emotion about poker was this is the thing I do that makes me annoyed and upset and causes me to lose money. And the more I can avoid this, the better. And um, everything else was kind of like, well, everything else is great. So why would I play poker? It just puts me in this, it just makes me upset. Right. So I went to Australia. I have this you know, long history with the Crown Casino, the Aussie Millions, Australia as a whole. I knew I won the place in poker there. It continued to not go well. Um, and I was just basically on a downswing and I sold half of myself in the main event to Timex. And uh, he gave me chips in line to register. And I was just going to settle up with him online or whatever, or he, or he owed me or something like that. And I took my phone out of my pocket while I was in line to register for the tournament. It knocked one of the 5K chips out of my pocket. The chip was like the exact same color as the carpet. Plus there's people everywhere. Um, I get insanely tilted. Like we never find the 5K chip. It's gone. They check the cameras. Now it's like when we're about to start the tournament and I'm already on like the biggest tilt that I can remember in wow. my whole career. And I was like, you know what? Like, don't play in this condition. If this is how you feel, don't play. If you don't want to be here to begin with and you just you know, torched 5K um, that you're really pissed off to lose in the middle of a downswing, like don't do this to yourself and, and force yourself to play. So I left. And Timex, smart investor that he is, is just hitting me up the whole time. He knows how soft the Aussie millions is. He's like, look, you should really play this one. Hey, even if you don't want to risk your own money, I'll free roll you. You can have, you know, 17%. I keep 83. We basically extrapolate the markup you sold me at. And I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, I'll get back to you. I don't know. Fuck, you know, fuck this tournament. Fuck poker. I don't want any of it, anything to do with any of this. Um, and I just left. I left the Crown Casino and I went about my day for like eight, nine hours. And nine o'clock rolls around and I both, you know, calmed down and uh I've been drinking a little bit and was kind of like yeah you know what maybe i will light 10k of timex's money on fire that sounds pretty fun and i was like you know message him I was like yo is that offer still open and he was like yeah but you know do you um do you mind taking a 15 instead of 17 because now it's such late reg and i remember i replied i said doesn't matter to me i'm gonna lose your money anyway and <laughs> i went back i registered you know i ran good that night the next day i two added somebody in a huge pot and after that, like, I swear to you, I've been playing poker almost 20 years. I have never run as good in one tournament as I ran in that Aussie Millions. Not even close. I just had the absolute, like, horseshoe, you know, jammed way up my butt. Like, cannot miss a pot. If I, anytime I did something that was close, I remember this one big hand. I opened deuces in late position. And this really good player who was giving me trouble three bet me. And I was like, well, in a sane world, I would just, you know, fold or maybe take a flop. But in this version of the world, I'm all in. <laughs> you know, like, there's a very real edge in not being afraid to lose. I think yeah. that if you reach a point where you're recklessly gambling, like now we're just kind of, now we're suffering from selection bias where we both tell a story where, you know, either myself or Ras plays extra reckless and ends up the winner. And it's like, well, why did that happen? Eh, probably a lot of luck. But I do really believe that if you want to play your best game, you cannot have any fear of losing. Like you can't reach, you know, get deep in a final table. And then you start thinking about like the money and how much it's going to affect you and what you need for your life. Like you're just not going to be able to play your best game if the money means too much to you. And you're like you know, agonizing over payout jumps or trying to figure out, yeah. okay, I need to get third in order to solve the financial problems that I have. So I've always felt that I wanted to piece myself to a level where I'm not really sweating it if I lose or if I have to lose multiple bullets, like whatever that comes to, I don't care. So that when I get deep, 
I can play like the money doesn't matter to me, even though in the back of my mind, I'm conscious of those things. I'm thinking about, you know, ICM, the pay ladder, I'm not talking off my chips. It's part of my strategy, but there's no fear. There's no like, oh, I, I really don't want to go out now because then I won't get to realize all the money or I won't get third and get to solve my problem. Like anytime I'm in a tournament, I'm there to try and maximize my earn. Tell me about this though, live poker. Like you, so what made Australia, it's a pretty long way to go for your first, yeah. uh, first events or at least first hand mob scores. Maybe you played a couple and didn't cash, whatever your first ever, you know, here, what, what made you go to Australia? That's a hike. Well, actually that, uh, I think even a year before I was playing down there, I won a package on party poker when I was in my dorm room as like a 19 year old and went down there, got two seats into uh, a couple of Aussie millions events, almost final table to one and ended up swapping with the guy who won. So I made a really, you know, back then my whole bankroll was like $2,500, 3k and I won 15k us on that trip. So at that point I was just like sold on the whole lifestyle and you know, the most fun I ever had. I met you know, Mike Sexton and all of these poker heroes of mine. Um, so I think that that team's event was one of those where it was like right after I moved to Australia and did study abroad there, they did a smaller series and that team's event must have been the first one that they tracked the results for. So I grew up in Wisconsin and I was there till I was 20. So I'm still like huge Wisconsin sports fan. I need sports to come back, man. This is this is the year for the Bucks and Giannis. Like it's our year. We need the NBA back. Um, you know, fingers crossed and all that. I went to Australia for a study abroad when I was uh, 20 and was down there for the better part of five years and started traveling a lot on the tournament circuit around then. So, you know, I got into poker in my mid late teens in high school back. I was actually playing online poker before Moneymaker won the World Series main event. Like I remember following the online updates back when live reporting uh, of online poker tournaments was kind of in its infancy. And uh, I was just like, you know, one of the excited poker fans following along. And it used to be like back in April, they would run this thing. And then once they put it on television, you know what happened. I mean, the game just blew up. The combination of Moneymaker winning the World Series and the World Poker Tour appearing every Wednesday, you know, blew the game up in the American imagination. And, uh, you know, I was very central for it. I was, uh, it was a right time and place for people of my age because there was this online community that sprung up. I was a big part of the two plus two um multi-table tournament community and those guys in the whole ntt community you know did a great job of helping each other learn the game and a lot of those players that came up in that community are still some of the top players in poker today you know maybe they were in the mtt community maybe they were in the cash community but that two plus two forum um sprung a lot of the prominent players in the game today so i was a big part of that I was in Australia traveling a lot of the Asian Pacific tour for a few years, started playing the World Series every summer when I was 21 um, and moved back to the States and got this job with the World Poker Tour when I was 25. And that was very unexpected for me because like a lot of people my age, I just planned to be a professional poker player for my whole life uh, and didn't didn't really want a job, but they kind of came up with an opportunity to pursue one that sounded so intriguing. I was like, yeah, screw it. Let's, you know, let's see what happens. They're not going to hire me anyway. Um, and next thing I knew I had a career. And so that is for the last 10 years now been an equal part of my responsibility to poker, both as, you know, a player who wants to take the game seriously and stay competitive, uh, and, you know, continue to challenge myself. Was that, I mean, that was a big score for you. That was a 42 K score. Um, pretty exciting. Was that, was that a memorable experience? I mean, I was 21. It was my first world series. And I think I had pretty much bricked the series leading up to the main event. So I was kind of down on myself. And, uh, then in the main, I took what is to this day, still one of the craziest beats I've ever taken on day two. And was just like really, really low on chips, but then pretty much ran on, like just ran fire for about, I don't know, 24 hours. And Something to point out is that the structure was so different back then. That was a field of almost 9,000 people. I made the top 200 and I got eliminated early day four. And then the only other deep run I've made in the World Series, I got a 50th in like 2010. And the structure had changed so much by then that, you know, like that was mid day seven. And now I think if you were to go out in like the top 200 in the World Series, like you're talking about day six ish or something like that, it's a considerably slower tournament. So, yeah, you know, back then, I was so young and inexperienced and just like every pot, my heart is pounding out of my chest. Everybody else was such a beginner and just kind of like clicking buttons in a lot of the same way I was. You know, I remember seeing Jamie Gold and his mountain of chips around back then. And there was this kid that he was always kind of like battling with in the um, in the TV broadcast. I can't remember him. He was at my final, he was at my table for a while. 
and and he got into it with a lot of people but that was such a different era where very few people at the table were seasoned professionals a lot of them were essentially tourists doing something you know for the first time or one of the first few times it was super fun to them and so it was a really different environment of people kind of just clowning around and i would say that the the biggest change to me in the environment of poker over those 15 years is how much more serious it has become that basically you've taken something that was a little more of like a, a recreational sociable activity and turned it more like a very serious chess tournament and it's not a complaint um that's that's not some kind of criticism of how poker has changed it's just the reality of how the game observation yeah i'd agree with yeah. that do you play exactly the same is it irrelevant of the buy buy and you believe you should and do you I would say pretty close any any changes i would make are an adjustment over the changes i think my opponents are making and so if you go deep in a 25k well you're probably going to be surrounded by a bunch of the best in the world and so you know trying to over adjust or exploit these guys is, is not going to go really well whereas if you go deep in the 215 on party a lot of your opponents might be playing only one day a week of poker and might be playing for an amount of money that would be incredibly life-changing to them. And that's where you can start to identify some players who are gonna be extra cautious, extra tight, or occasionally a player who is gambling way too much or trying to uh, steamroll with the chip lead and you can take advantage of that a little bit. But you know, on the whole, I go there with the mindset of just playing the game that I have uh, practiced and trained myself to play. I think you made a good point that attitudes about gambling in the United States are changing. And part of that is we're starting to proliferate sports betting, uh, legalized sports betting. You know, we've had this new interpretation of the wire act that was used to, um, you know, help prosecute the online poker companies. And now we're saying that, okay, you know, we're not really going to, <laughs> how to put it, we're not going to mine the wire act so much anymore. And so as gambling in both the form of sports betting and increasingly Robin Hood, I think people betting on the market are starting to accept how much of a casino that is. For a long time, there was distinction of like, oh, finance is a different word from, from gambling. It's like, no, it's just a fancy word for gambling. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the Robin Hood uh, popularity that we're seeing across the United States, I think, is also changing attitudes about gambling and that people are just sort of gambling as a whole. So, yeah, certainly when I got started in the game almost 20 years ago, attitudes about poker players were very different. When my parents found out I was gambling and playing online, they really thought that I was like a problem gambler who was going to lose all his money and ruin his life. Because at that time, there was no such thing as a professional gambler or a professional poker player in your your average american's conception there was it was just like people with gambling problems and gambled too much and lost there was no examples of successful american gamblers and the only ones we had were people like warren buffett who portrayed it as finance um, right so yeah i've definitely noticed attitudes are changing and now we see in magazines or being tweeted out and so forth like really like thoughtful breakdown articles from sp professional sports bettors like i read this awesome article the other day about somebody who would bet Val Demings to be vice president at 50 to one. And now when I see people engage in that, it comes with a different attitude. It's no longer like this, you know, um, hostility or suspicion towards gamblers. This kind of like, oh, gamblers are sharp. Let's hear what they're saying and what they're thinking. And so it's cool yeah. to see that shift.